My Ending to the Marriage Stone by Crookshank87 Chapter 2 78B Snape flew through the halls of Hogwarts as fast as he could without actually running. He had pulled out Harry's heartstone from the inside of his shirt and was desperately gripping it. The thought of his heartstone had sent a wild hope surging through Severus. Actually being able to do something sent adrenaline and blood pounding throughout his body. S Snape absently noted the hallways were empty. Normally, when he stalked the hallways, students were jumping out of his way. For once, luck was with him in a tiny matter. The empty halls let Severus move faster. Despite his quick pace, he felt like it took him an eternity to make it to the headmaster's office. Severus growled with impatience as he spit out the password. Butterscotch, of all things. The gargoyle guarding the headmaster's office moved sluggishly. Did the thing actually move slower when visitors were in a hurry? Finally, the gargoyle was out of his way. Snape strode up the stairs, taking them two at a time, pounding on the door. A treacherous thought creeped into his head. What if Harry's heartstone couldn't lead him back? Snape forced the thought out of his mind as he pounded harder on the door. He would know soon enough. Pounding on the door a third time, Snape realized the headmaster never took this long to let someone in. For the first time, Snape could remember the headmaster was not ready to see him as soon as he ascended the stairs. He grabbed the door and hurled it open. He would not wait. The office was empty. Snape stared in shock, temporarily unable to comprehend why the headmaster would not be in his office. The events of the past few days abruptly got up with Snape. While he had been focused on Harry, he had all but forgotten what was going on with the rest of the world. Feeling foolish, Snape realized that the headmaster was helping with the rescue efforts. There were so many muggles that needed care and so few wizards to give it. Of course, the headmaster was helping with them. He wouldn't be twiddling his fingers up in his office while muggles were dying. Snape sighed and resigned himself to searching the whole castle. He just hoped the headmaster was in the castle. It took him an agonizing hour, but Snape finally found him. He found the headmaster in the charms classroom surrounded by squibs and students being taught how to insert a catheter. Snape shook his head trying to get the images of a catheter out of his mind and was immensely grateful for the conveniences of magic. He slipped in between the men and women as unobtrusively as was possible, it was very natural for Snape, and made his way over to the headmaster. At first, Dumbledore didn't notice him. He was very intent on the squib instructing the group. What he saw on Dumbledore's face worried him. Dumbledore's eyes were grave, and his face was drawn in worry. Snape had never seen Dumbledore like this. Dumbledore should be excited to be learning about new muggle things. But instead, he was sitting quietly with slightly hunched shoulders, looking every minute of his age. Snape was reminded of the only other time Dumbledore had lost hope, when Voldemort had the Eye of Odin. Harry Potter had restored that hope by performing a miracle, and now it seemed the world needed another miracle from the boy. Snape reached out and tapped Dumbledore on the shoulder. Dumbledore turned with a slight look of surprise on his face. Snape pursed his lips in disapproval. Dumbledore finally started acting like a normal human, just when Snape didn't want him to. As soon as Dumbledore met his eyes, the twinkle returned in full force. Snape couldn't help but wonder what he looked like. He felt frantic and out of control. That certainly wouldn't inspire hope. I need to talk to you, Snape said quietly. He didn't want to disturb the lesson. He knew how important it was that these people learn to care for the sleeping muggles. Dumbledore nodded. Together they made their way out of the charms classroom, only earning a few curious looks from the people surrounding them. What is it, my boy? Dumbledore asked as soon as the door had shut. Snape held up his hand, still gripping Harry's heartstone. He had never let it go. His knuckles were white and his hand was strained from holding it tightly for so long. But he didn't want to let it go. Harry's heartstone. Black said Harry might be able to follow his magic back to his body. Snape trailed off and willed Dumbledore with all his mind to believe it might work. For one second, Dumbledore appeared confused, but then his face broke out into a smile. Brilliant, my boy, brilliant, Dumbledore exclaimed. That might just do it. His heartstone is so powerful. If anybody could follow it back to his core, it would be Harry. Maybe Harry would pull off yet another of his logic-defying miracles. Dumbledore began walking toward the hospital wing at a speed that was surely not normal for a man Dumbledore's age. Snape let out a sigh of relief and exasperation. Dumbledore was acting like Dumbledore again. Annoying, but reassuring, he supposed. Perhaps he only looked so distraught in the charms classroom because of the catheter. It was a rather disturbing process. How exactly will this work? Snape asked. It's really very simple. When people walk on an astral plane, they return to their body by following their magic back to their core. Severus nodded. He already knew this after all. 
Pomfrey believes Harry can't return because he's lost track of his magic. If you and Harry had been bonded, you would have been able to reach out to him and stimulate his magic. In theory, he would have been able to feel that and follow the connection back to you and his body. The Heartstone should be able to do the same thing. Dumbledore paused as he opened the door to the hospital wing. The scene before them was chaos. Squibs, muggles, and injured wizards filled the beds. Pomfrey and dozens of barely trained students scurried about attempting to treat as many people as possible. A couple of people looked over at Dumbledore and Snape but quickly went back to work. They were too exhausted to spare much attention for the living. The living that weren't dying. The two men started weaving their way through the crowd, making their way toward Harry's bed. Just as they were about to open the curtains around him, Hermione bumped into them. She had been helping Pomfrey. Has anything changed? She asked, looking from Snape to Dumbledore. Maybe. Come in with us, Dumbledore offered. Snape shut the curtain around Harry's bed as soon as they had entered and recast a silencing charm to ensure privacy. Sirius was still sitting with Harry. He looked half annoyed that Severus hadn't trusted him to cast a simple silencing charm, but mostly he just looked helplessly hopeful. Wearing your heart on your sleeve must be a requirement for Gryffindor, Severus noted in annoyance. Hermione looked pitifully exhausted, now hopeful, and run down. She probably hadn't rested since the rescue efforts began. Severus couldn't make himself feel guilty for not helping more with the efforts. He was needed here. They all pulled up chairs around Harry and sat down. As Dumbledore quickly explained the situation to Hermione and Sirius, Snape studied Harry. He was perfectly still, face pale, and drawn as though in stress. Snape turned impatiently to Dumbledore. Harry was suffering. Their explanation could wait. Seeing Snape's fierce glare, Dumbledore gave Snape a patient glance. And that brings us to this point. Dumbledore began. Take out the heartstone and hold it over Harry's chest. It's as simple as that. His heartstone in the presence of his body should stimulate a connection between his magic and mind, allowing him to follow his heartstone's magic back to this physical location. Once his mind is drawn back here, it should be able to merge with his body. Dumbledore sounded calm and hopeful. His eyes sparkled in cliché Dumbledore fashion. Snape couldn't feel calm, but he did feel an anxious hope. In all likelihood, a fool's hope. He lifted the heartstone over Harry's chest. His hands were steady, but barely. They all stared intently at Harry, hoping. Harry inhaled, exhaled, and inhaled again. Nothing happened. His eyes remained closed. Snape felt the crushing despair of defeat. He gripped the chain of the heartstone as hard as he could, turning his knuckles white. His hands began to shake despite his best effort to keep them still. It failed? Hermione asked the question Severus wouldn't voice. Dumbledore's lips were turned down in a frown, but he didn't look nearly as devastated as Severus felt. These things take time. Harry's mind might be very far from here. It could take him some time to follow the connection back, keep the heartstone there, and give Harry time to follow the connection back. There is still hope, Dumbledore said with conviction. He will come back, Sirius said with absolute confidence. Let the boy pull off another miracle, Severus wished. He didn't look away from Harry even as Dumbledore spoke. Try talking to him. Hearing your voice might help encourage him, Dumbledore suggested. Snape sneered in self-depreciating anger. What a pathetically Gryffindor idea. He was hardly the kind of man that believed coma patients could hear anything around them. Surely his voice wouldn't encourage Harry to come speeding back. He almost laughed at the idea. But perhaps hope was a contagious disease the Gryffindors had infected him with. He wanted to believe Dumbledore was right. There was hope. He barely noticed as Dumbledore persuaded Hermione and Sirius to leave with him so they could continue the rescue efforts. A band-aid on a gaping wound. Come back, Harry, Snape whispered. He winced at the raw emotion he heard in his voice, but he couldn't really bring himself to care. No one was here to hear his weakness, and if Harry could hear, maybe he would take pity on him in return. Severus wasn't sure how much time had passed, but eventually Sirius and Remus came to check on Harry. Hermione and Sirius had spread the news about Harry's heartstone. Everyone was hoping, hoping, hoping... The three men stared at Harry, each one voicing encouragement to Harry. Hours passed. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Nothing changed. Harry lay on the bed, pale and still. The three men continued to stare and whisper desperately. Eventually, Ramus left, only to return shortly with food for the three of them. Whatever food he put in his mouth tasted like ash, 
but he ate it. He needed to stay strong for Harry. Severus noted for once the mutt's appetite seemed to be tame as well. Eventually, Sirius urged Severus to let him take over so he could get some sleep. Grudgingly, he handed the heartstone over to Sirius. Running himself to the point of exhaustion wouldn't help Harry, but it was painful for him to let go of the stone. It was a piece of Harry. He could feel Harry's electric, wild magic, and he didn't want to let go of it. Sirius gave him a look of understanding as Severus let out an involuntary sigh when the heartstone had been transferred to him. Snape tried to sneer back at him. He wasn't sure why, but Sirius's understanding made him angry. Sirius did not seem impressed by Snape's sneer. Snape transfigured his chair into a cot and laid back on it. Though it was uncomfortable, it didn't take him long to fall asleep. One last conscious thought floated through his mind. He was addicted to the feel of Harry's magic. The magic from the heartstone wasn't enough. He wanted to feel the magic from Harry's skin, not from a rock. Snape woke up early the next morning to see Pomfrey checking on Harry. Sirius was curled up sleeping on the bed next to Harry in his dug form. Alarmed, Severus searched for Harry's heartstone. It was right above his chest. Ron Weasley was holding it. Severus sighed in relief and annoyance. Sirius should have woken him up when he wanted to sleep. Severus grabbed the heartstone out of Ron's hand without a word. I am capable of holding a heartstone. Ron bit out in annoyance. I'm aware, Severus said levelly to him. Severus turned to Pomfrey. How is he? He asked her. No change, she said with a shake of her head. Severus could see she didn't look hopeful. She bit her lip as though uncertain how to best continue. Well, almost no change, Pomfrey added. It does appear that his levels of adrenaline have spiked and lowered slightly. That's good, right? Ron demanded. Severus could easily see in Pomfrey's face that she did not think it was good. Not exactly. It means that his body's in less fear. Pomfrey gave Ron a stern glare before he could interrupt. Less fear could be caused for two reasons. The first, and less likely, I believe, is that his mind has become more aware and that he knows what's going on. However, if that was the case, he probably would have woken up by now. She pursed her lips together and sighed before continuing. The second reason is that he's become more dissociated from his body. His mind and body are so disconnected that the fear he feels is no longer provoking a response in his body. With that, Pomfrey left to go check on other patients. Ron's face dropped and stiffened in pain. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Nothing changed. Severus took over late that night, letting Severus sleep again after Lupin had brought him dinner again. Ron took over early in the morning. Hermione stopped by to see Ron and Harry in the morning, looking exhausted. She was working herself ragged, trying to save the muggles, then again, so was everyone. It had been days since the attack. No one had discovered a way to wake the muggles. The muggles were starting to dehydrate. Many had already died. The only ones that would live were the ones that had been taken in by the wizards. Severus couldn't bring himself to care about that or anything but Harry. And if... When... Harry woke. How devastated would he be? A whole world of people he had failed to save. Undoubtedly, he would blame himself. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Nothing changed. Later that afternoon, Sirius came to sit with him again, presumably to take over later so Severus could eat lunch. It irked him. It grated on his nerves. Black wasn't supposed to pity him. Black was supposed to despise him. Snape wasn't the sort of man that needed or appreciated pity, but he got it now. His whole world had been turned upside down. Black was supposed to despise him. The two of them shouldn't be sitting together in companionable silence. They should be throwing insults, snarling, or on the verge of violence. But nothing much was the way it was supposed to be in the world now. Most of all, Harry. Harry was supposed to be full of life. Face flushed with passion and eyes flashing with emotion. He was not supposed to be pale and still lying in a hospital bed, but he was, and that was why Black pitied him. Black's pity was a declaration of what they both feared. It was too late. Harry was never waking up. Snape felt his shoulders hunch involuntarily. Perhaps it was some long-forgotten reflex as his body unconsciously tried to reduce the pain raging inside him. It was Friday. 
Severus had never been so aware of the day of the week. Tonight was the night Harry had agreed to go on a date with him. Though it had only been four days since the date had been set, Sape felt as though it had been a lifetime. In those four days, the world had morphed into something Snape barely recognized. The world had no hope without Harry. As the true king, only Harry could save it, and Snape had no use for the world without Harry. He didn't care that every time Poppy walked into the room, she had a sad look of resignation in her eyes. He didn't care that he had been holding this hearthstone over Harry's chest for over two days now. Most of all, he didn't care that so many others were beginning to think it was too late. He was not giving up. He was always a stubborn man by nature, and now was no time to change that. He would not give up on Harry. At least he wasn't alone. Black would not give up either. Sighing, he glanced up at the man beside him. Black met his gaze. He saw the pain that reflected in Black's eyes. He couldn't stand to see it and looked down. Like so many other things, it reminded him of Harry. Why a single Gryffindor couldn't keep their emotions off their face was beyond him. Surely it wasn't that hard! Snape focused back on Harry. Come back to your body, Harry. Snape whispered. It had to have been the millionth time he said it, and he would say it a million more times if that's what it took to get Harry back to him. He would not give up. Come back to us. Severus was hungry. He hadn't eaten since Lupin had brought him dinner the night before, but he didn't want to hand the heartstone over to Sirius. He felt tensed like a caged animal. Every second dragged on. Every second felt like the climax of a story. With every breath Harry took, Severus expected him to wake up or die. Harry couldn't continue this way, halfway between life and death. This was going to end one way or another, and the ending was coming soon. He could feel it. Wake up, Harry, Severus commanded quietly. He didn't even care that his voice broke. Sirius's eye didn't flicker in acknowledgement of his weakness. He had heard it before in his own voice and in Black's. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Gasp! Severus and Sirius both shot to their feet and peered over Harry. This was it. Harry would live or die. Severus could barely breathe, but he managed to bark out, Get home free! Black didn't move. He simply gripped Harry's hand harder. Neither man was willing to leave Harry's side. Severus could see Harry's eyes start to flicker. That had to be a good sign. His breathing wasn't steady. A bad indication. Slowly, ever so slowly, Harry's eyes began to open. Severus sucked in a deep breath in relief. Fine, Marlin! Sirius exclaimed. Get Poppy! Severus ordered. Sirius dashed away. Are you alright? Severus had to know. Had Harry pulled off another miracle? He looked so pale, lifeless, but his eyes were clear and alert. Harry made a rasping noise. Severus stared in panic for a second. No, Harry couldn't be taken from him now. Then the logically side of Snape asserted itself. The boy had been in a coma for the past three and a half days. Of course, Severus sighed in relief. You haven't had anything to drink since the attack. He quickly helped Harry drink some water. Riley, he thought to himself. Gryffindor does not rub off on people. He couldn't even remember letting his emotions so badly mar his thought process. That he had to know. Was Harry all right? How are you? Severus demanded the information. His eyes flickered around in annoyance. What was taking Pomfrey so long? Harry needed medical attention, not questions from a worried bondmate. Alive. Harry said with a shrug in a weak voice. Severus almost growled in frustration. That barely told him anything, but before he could say anything, Pomfrey entered the room with Black. Harry started to ask a question, but Pomfrey sternly cut him off. He needed to rest, and Pomfrey needed to run tests to make sure he was all right. Severus sat down in exhausted relief. Harry could talk. He could respond. The experience hadn't driven him from his body permanently. Harry hadn't been driven insane. Everything was going to be all right. He would hold on to that foolish Gryffindor hope. Harry still looked pale, and he had a haunted look in his eyes that Severus had seen before. But he looked alive. Severus reached out and gently touched Harry's hand. Under the heat of Harry's hand, he could feel magic buzzing like electricity under his skin. For the first time in what felt like forever, Severus felt happy. Pomfrey looked happy as well. Well, you're magically exhausted, but that appears to be the extent of the damage. She shook her head in disbelief. You'll need bed rest for at least the next three days, but you should make a full recovery, assuming you can get some rest. She admonished.
Pomfrey coaxed him to swallow a potion, then another, and a last. Snape recognized them as a variety of restorative potions. Just after Harry got the last potion, his eyes began drooping. Let me know if there's any change, and let him get some sleep. She gave a pointed look at Sirius, who was barely restraining himself from jumping up and down. He's exhausted and needs to rest. Right now! After Snape nodded, she rushed off to help with the muggles. There was too much work to do and not enough people to do it. Harry's eyes closed immediately and he fell into a natural, restful sleep. He must be exhausted like everybody else. Severus's attention was drawn away from Harry by Sirius. Sirius finally gave in and began jumping up and down in silent excitement, unable to contain his joy and relief. Severus felt so numb with relief, unable to move. He was paralyzed. Black lunged at him suddenly. Before he could move, he realized Sirius was hugging him. Severus was a little horrified, but unable to respond. He simply stood there and gazed over at Harry. He's going to live. Sirius whispered in his face while grabbing his shoulders and shaking him. Severus finally managed to draw his eyes back away from Harry and nod. Thank mother. He forced through his teeth. Black better not insist on hugging him again. Yes, they had gone through an ordeal together, but that did not make them friends. Severus shook his head as though trying to shake out the overwhelming emotions he felt so he could think. He sat down by Harry's bed and held his hand. It was warm and soft and perfect. He didn't care if Black saw. Harry was his bondmate. He'd be damned if anyone complained about some hand-holding. Black annoyed him further by giving him another understanding look, but what he said afterwards made up for it. I'll leave you two alone and spread the news. Dumbledore will want to know. Severus watched the man leave. The man was nearly skipping as he left. He sat there staring at Harry for a long time. He wasn't sure how he felt. He simply knew he felt as though his life had been given back to him. For the first time in days, he contemplated Harry's and his future. The future looked bleak and empty without Harry. He would fight tooth and nail to keep Harry by his side. He just had to manage to find a way to keep Harry alive and happy with him. He couldn't bear to make Harry unhappy. Certainly, he couldn't bear it if Harry died. He knew Harry had feelings for him. His reaction to Andre was proof enough of that. He knew Harry reacted positively enough when he had kissed him. What did it all mean? Zephyr aside, he didn't know what the future for them held. He merely knew he had to try. And today was Friday. He had promised Harry a date. It was a bad time for a date. Harry couldn't even leave the hospital wing. The world was in shambles, for goodness sake! But Harry's life would always be chaotic, and he wasn't going to wait for a peaceful time to try and win Harry over. Who knew how long the war would last? Despite everything, he was going to go on a date with Harry tonight. Even if it meant Severus ate beside Harry's bed while he slept. He wouldn't put the relationship on hold another minute. He didn't know how, but he was going to attempt to romance and woo a Gryffindor tonight.